on this edition of It's a Miracle. A young woman is attacked by her estranged boyfriend. The next thing she knew, she was being stuffed into the trunk of a car and driven away. And I'm thinking nobody knows that I'm gone from my house. Nobody's gonna know I'm gone. Now it will take a miracle to set her free. The story of two very unlikely friends. I have never known a pig to take up with cattle. I've never known a cow to take up with pigs. They just naturally took to one another. And then, one night, their friendship faced the ultimate test. I thought, there's no way these animals survived. No way. But they were in for an amazing surprise. Challenged by cerebral palsy at an early age, meet a young man who never let it slow him down. I think he's the most competitive person I've ever seen in anything he does. You'll be inspired by watching this tenacious student in his quest for a miracle. A miraculous rescue at sea is captured on real video. Just as I had finished getting him in the straw, this wave hit us. These stories and more on this edition of It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle, a miracle. Happening to everyday people. Changing their lives forever. It's a miracle. And now, from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight's show is about the courage and resilience of the human spirit. It's about people who have faced incredible challenges and turned what seemed like hopeless situations into miracles. Our first story is a perfect example. It's a combination of danger, determination, and divine intervention. Amy Maxwell was 16 years old and living with her family in Huntsville, Alabama, when she became involved with a fellow high school student named David. We didn't date very long, and I got pregnant. I was 17, and I was living at home. And so uh, halfway through my pregnancy, he started to live with us at my dad's house. And then after Bradley was born, he lived there for about two months, two or three months, and then we split up. Young Bradley became the center of a bitter fight between his teenage parents. When he was two, they both hired lawyers and a custody hearing was set for January 1999. A week before Christmas, he called me real upset and was crying and wanted to see Bradley for Christmas. And so I told him that he could get him that Tuesday morning, but he had to have him home Christmas Eve because we had family coming. You ready to go? Be back on Christmas Eve, right? No problem. Six o'clock. There you go. He picked him up Tuesday morning, and Christmas Eve comes, and he doesn't show up. So I start thinking, well, maybe I'm supposed to go get him. So I leave and go to his house. David! And nobody's there, nobody answers the door. So I went around to the back door, and he, he's in there talking, but he won't answer the door. David, I the glass is missing from one of the panes on the door. And so I reached in and opened the door. Amy went inside to find her son, but what she discovered caught her completely off guard. He had a shotgun pointed at me. You're breaking and entering. Yes. And had 911 on the phone and told 911 that somebody was breaking in the house and he was going to shoot him. Tell me where you took my son. He's not here and you're not getting him. And he wouldn't tell where Bradley was at. And since legally neither of us had custody, it was whoever physically had him. A week later, the day before the custody hearing, David had still not returned her son, and the situation was about to explode. I got up at like 7.30, let the dog out to go to the bathroom. I left the door kind of cracked, because that's, you know, just what I usually do. And I went back in my room to get my clothes out of the closet. Moments later, David entered the house through the open door and quietly climbed the stairs to Amy's bedroom. I'm standing in the closet, and I saw something out of the corner of my eye, and as I turned, he grabbed me, and we fell back into my closet. He had a roll of tape in his hand, and he was trying to get my arms together to tape them together. 
And we fought for about 20 minutes before he actually was physically able to sit on me and get my arms taped together. So he taped me at my knees and my wrists and my ankles. Where are the keys at? Where are the car keys? <laughs> Let me go! He went outside to get the car keys, and I was trying to find the phone. I found the phone, and I was trying to dial 911. But before she could dial the numbers, David was back in the room. What are you doing? He tried to suffocate me, cover my mouth, and cover my nose. I struggled with him, and then I pretended like I passed out. As she laid there pretending to be unconscious, he wrapped her limp body in a blanket and carried her out the back door. I see my car with the trunk open. I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm going in the trunk. He put me in the trunk, shut the trunk, got in the car, and left. Amy's terrifying ordeal continues when it's a miracle returns. When Amy Maxwell agreed to let the estranged father of her child take him for the weekend before Christmas, she had no idea what was to follow. When he didn't return the boy, she went to his home to confront him, but instead found herself staring down the barrel of a shotgun. A week later, he unexpectedly entered her home, attacked her, tied her up with duct tape, and attempted to suffocate her, stopping only after she feigned unconsciousness. The next thing she knew, she was being stuffed into the trunk of her car and driven away. Where was he taking her? What would he do when they got there? Amy wasted no time working the tape off her face and then started on her hands. He had taped my hands in front of me, so all I had to really do was just get it with my teeth and unroll it. And once I had my hands undone, I just took it off my legs. I mean, I rode in there forever. I mean, the whole time I'm like, you know, going in between crying and praying and freaking out. And the next thing I remember was I heard on the radio it was Chattanooga USO. That's their radio station. And I was like, I'm in Tennessee. And I'm thinking, nobody knows that I'm gone from my house. Nobody's going to know I'm gone. After several hours on the road, David was forced to stop for gas. Amy had no idea where or why he'd stopped until she heard the gas cap coming off. It was then that she began kicking and screaming for help. David just turned the radio up as loud as it would go. But he'd underestimated Amy's ingenuity in the face of danger. Speaker wires run in the back of the trunk. And I ripped the speaker wires and started screaming and was kicking the trunk. <laughs> I could hear it run around the car and jump back in, and he took off. It was a great idea, yet it failed to attract the attention of anyone who could help. But it helped convince Amy that she wasn't powerless. That's where I got the idea to take out the brake lights. I took all the tail lights out because they just kind of snap in. And I was thinking, you know, maybe he would get pulled over for not having any brake lights or tail lights. I thought, that's going to require a police officer to get behind us and to actually see and then pull him over. So then I started thinking about stuff that was in my car. My car has a standard jack that comes with the car, you know, and the handle just comes off. And I shoved it through the hole and I busted out the taillight. And I could see that we were on the highway. I could see behind me. And whenever cars would get close, I would start sticking stuff out of the taillight like paper towels and my finger, the jack handle, and the light, I would stick the light in the hole and try to flash, you know. None of the passing motorists seemed to take any notice of her desperate attempts to get their attention. But Amy was about to experience a miracle. The dramatic conclusion, right after this. It's been over four hours since Amy Maxwell was kidnapped and stuffed into the trunk of her car. During that time, another couple, Terry and Dale Schroeder, experienced an unusual set of delays as they returned from their vacation. They'd started out later than planned, stopping at an unscheduled place on the map, 
and leaving again just in time to end up behind Amy's car. As they followed the car, something caught Dale's eye. Terry, look at that. That's your odd. Tail light lens was broken, but the light bulb kept on coming in out of the hole. What is that? Can you so I said, there's something it? strange about the back of that car. I, I told her, I said, watch that. And I said, let's see what happens with it. That's weird. I had thought at one time that a car was following us, but then they would back off. I thought that nobody knew that I was there. And I said, well, I'm going to just watch it for a while. So I caught back up with him, stayed behind him. And pretty soon, paper started coming out, just this little hole from the taillight. And then the tire tool would come out, wiggle around, and then go back in. And at one time, she said that she thought she thought a finger, and we thought maybe it was a college prank. I pulled up beside and passed him, and she said, no, there's nothing out of the ordinary on the inside. So, Somebody in there. There has to be someone locked in the trunk. There couldn't be anything out. Basically, every scenario we could come up with was not good. <laughs> so we decided we better do something. Why don't you call the cops? Well, what would we tell them, though? They'll think we're nuts. <laughs> yeah, it's we're just not something you see every day, so uh, you just don't well, consider that somebody's actually locked in the trunk. Yeah. So we thought, if we're stupid, we're stupid. If not, you know, so what? Ma'am, I, I hope you don't think this is a prank or something, but I... Uh... A little embarrassed and unsure of what was happening, Dale and Terry felt they couldn't let it go, and they called 911. We kind of told them, we don't know if it's really something, but we think it's strange, and uh, they took it seriously right away. They would ask us what location we're at or what exit, what mile marker, and we'd tell them. Yeah, well, we and I finally told him, I said, well, we just passed a police car back there. And then they came back and said, OK, he's got you in sight. I didn't even know that somebody had called 911. I didn't even know that anybody had told the police. I didn't have any idea. And when I saw the police car, I started just putting light in there, sticking stuff out. I mean, I was doing it fast. And they pulled him over. And when they pulled us over, I started, I mean, just screaming and hitting the trunk. <laughs> I was okay. I was just a little scratched, a little bruised, really scared. Amy was taken to the hospital and released without injury. David was taken to jail, where he remains today. He never said really what he was planning on doing. And I really don't like to speculate because it's just scary. During his interrogation, David told authorities that their son was safe in his grandfather's care. First time I saw my son in two weeks was 4 o'clock in the morning. And I woke him up. The next morning, I got up and I went to court. The judge awarded me full custody. And um, any visitation with his family is at my discretion. Several weeks later, Amy was finally able to meet the Schroders and thank them for what they had done. They formed an instant bond. They're like family now. They're people that I intend to be in touch with forever, so. We have a connection. Now it'll be a lifelong connection. As far as we're concerned, she's one of our children now. She's kind of been adopted into our family. <laughs> What's that face? Today, Amy's happily raising her son, thanks to the Schroders and the miraculous set of circumstances that put their lives together. Left at noon rather than at 6 in the morning like we always did. We stopped early, which was unusual. And then the next morning, we started late. Terry, look at that. Which That's put us arm. on an intercept course with the car, which I believe was God's timing. Truly, I believe that somewhere, some divine power put me in touch with the Schroders to find me, to get me home to my son. That would be the miracle, I think. In April, Amy's ex-boyfriend pled guilty to a federal kidnapping charge. He was later sentenced to more than four years in prison. We'll be right back. Coming up. Next thing I know, I was diving into the water and the boat was flipping over. Real video captures the terror of two men caught in the ocean's pounding surf. And then we'd kind of look over our shoulders and we'd say, here comes another one, here comes another one. 
And we'd say, okay, take a breath and then duck down. All they could do now is cling to their capsized boat and pray for a miracle. I could hold on, but I had a hard time keeping my muscles tight because they kept wanting to shake. They pretty much just followed each other around wherever they went. The story of two friends, a pig named Spammy and a calf named Spot. When they become trapped inside a burning barn, one of them reacts in a truly miraculous way. I don't think that given the circumstances, any other animal would have done the same. These stories and more when It's a Miracle continues. And now, once again, Richard Thomas. I began tonight's show by saying that it was about the courage and resilience of the human spirit, people who've turned hopeless situations into miracles. Well, I left something out. It's also about the courage and resilience of a pig, a little miracle named Spammy. Les and Wendy Morgan train horses in the ranch country north of Chico, California. And to save money, they raise a few head of livestock for their dinner table. We raise livestock to take away from going away to the grocery store and buying it in a package. The taste is a whole lot different, and it's kind of a personal satisfaction knowing that you raised it and that you're responsible for the quality of meat that you eat. There you go, T-Bone. The Morgans always give the animals they raise for food names associated with meat products. It makes it easier for our kids so that we know that we can't make pets out of them because they will eventually end up on our table for a meal. In the spring of 1999, the Morgans brought home a pig they named Spammy. So how's she doing? When full grown, Spammy would fill their freezer with a year's supply of pork. You get approximately four hams, two sets of ribs, bacon, pork steaks. It's all done at the butcher. They wrap it up and smoke it if you want it smoked. Spammy was put in a pen with a calf named Spot, who the Morgans were raising for breeding purposes. Friendships between different species are rare, but the two animals immediately hit it off. I have never known a pig to take up with cattle. I've never known a cow to take up with pigs. They just naturally took to one another. Wherever he would lay, she would go down and lay with him. Or if he was eating, she had to get up and eat. Um, they pretty much just followed each other around wherever they went. As the weeks passed and Spammy grew larger, the two friends became inseparable. Spot's always kind of a follower. He kind of follows what she does. Spammy's always been the one to get into anything that she could. Spot, he didn't really care just as long as he got fed. Spammy and Spot even became roommates, sharing a shed together. And then, on the night of May 4th, 1999, disaster struck. An electrical fire broke out in the shed. The fire happened at about 11.23, I think it was. Saw a bright light out the window and came over to the sliding glass door, and that's when I saw the folding shed where Spammy and Spot were housed. Yeah, we have a fire that's out of control. The whole structure was on fire. Um, it was glowing orange. By the time the fire department arrived, the shed was fully engulfed in flames. You could see right through. You could see the two by fours on the wall and just fire everywhere. It just looked like one huge flame, and the heat was so intense you couldn't get 20 feet away from it. I thought, there's no way these animals survived. They had perished in the fire. But as the firefighters began probing the wreckage, the Morgans heard an unusual sound. It just sounded like a really upset child, um, someone who wanted their mom or just somebody that was really frightened. Les followed the sound to a nearby pasture where he made an astonishing discovery. Spammy had survived. She was stressed, really hot, 
and she had soot marks that were running down her flank. A short distance away, Les discovered Spammy's constant companion, exhausted from the ordeal. When I found Spot, he was scared. He was a little singed, but he wasn't as stressed out as a pig. It wasn't until firefighter Benny Aguilar pointed out a hole punched through the back wall of the shed that everyone realized just how miraculous Spot and Spammy's survival had been. We noticed that her burn mark was parallel with the wood. It pretty much lined up because she, she got a pretty good burn. And also, the calf was singed pretty good, so it must have fallen right behind him. The singe marks on Spammy led investigators to conclude that she'd used her body to batter a hole in the flaming wall. Spammy was a hero. I think there's a miracle here. You wouldn't think that she would go to where the fire was to punch a hole in the wall. I don't think that, given the circumstances, any other animal would have done the same. In the weeks that followed, Spammy and Spot made a full recovery. But despite Spammy's act of bravery, the Morgans couldn't afford to keep her. Our budget plans for us to butcher him, and so feeding her beyond the six months was an expense that we didn't foresee and that we couldn't really afford. She was still destined for the butcher block. She was going to be raised to put on the table. That was her destiny. Dear Spammy, you're my hero. But publicity surrounding the fire and the brave little pig who saved her best friend's life took on a life of its own. told me the story, it was me. We got so many letters that her and Spot have their own mailbox. We've gotten pictures. We've actually had people donate a few dollars to help feed her. The Morgans couldn't ignore the tremendous outpouring of love for the four hams, two sets of ribs, bacon, and pork steaks they were raising. And so they decided to let Spammy live. She did something pretty special, and a lot of people took notice and that pretty much was a turning point for Spammy's life. I think that her friendship with a cow makes her special. She's just a great pig. It's, it's pretty miraculous the way everything happened and the way things are going. She saved the bacon. It's been several months since Spammy's heroic saved the bacon and the burger, and I wanted to catch up on how everyone's doing. So joining us now from their ranch in Chico, California, are Les and Wendy Morgan. Welcome to the show. Hi, Richard. Hi. Well, it looks like there wasn't enough room for Spot. Uh, Spammy's kind of hogging the limelight there. I hope they're still getting along. They're getting along great, just like brother and sister. They're playing together like two pigs. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. You know, it looks like Spammy's been growing a little bit. How much does she weigh now? Uh, she's about 300 pounds, pretty trim. Uh, she'll probably get up to about 500 pounds, and she's eating like a pig. That's a lot of bacon. She must have quite an appetite. Yeah, she probably eats between 25 and 30 pounds a week, uh, probably averaging money-wise, probably about 50 bucks a week or so. Wow. If people are interested in contacting Spammy and Spot, where can they write? Well, we've set up their own mailbox um, in Corning, California, at P.O. Box 1102. And the zip code's 96021, so that folks can send letters, or if they'd like to send some help any other way, we would really appreciate it. Okay. Do you have any regrets about keeping Spammy? No. No, not at all. Not at all. It's been great. Um, we've really enjoyed having her, probably more so than we thought. I think, yeah, I think we get more enjoyment out of her than the kids do, actually. <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks for sharing your story with us. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. We'll be right back. Coming up. The story of an amazing young man with a remarkable goal in life. Something most people might think of as an impossible dream. The people did not know how to react to my dream and they were speechless. If I was in their situation, who knows how I would have reacted. And what exactly is his dream? Here's a clue. This is really what he wants to do. It's the only thing he wants to do. I believe that it will happen. In fact, I don't just believe it, I know that it will happen. This uplifting story, next on It's a Miracle.
We've met many people on this show who've defied all expectations, but maybe none more so than the young man you're about to meet, Jeffrey Pontius. Those who know Jeffrey say that his entire life has been a miracle, and I think you'll agree. He's a bona fide portrait in courage and determination. And once you've met him, you're not likely to forget him. If a miracle is something that defies all odds, that overcomes insurmountable obstacles to achieve the impossible, then Jeffrey Pontius is a living example. Jeffrey is a 21-year-old college student who has chosen a career that most people cannot begin to accept or understand, given his physical limitations. Jeffrey was born with cerebral palsy, a disease that left him nearly quadriplegic. His grandparents, Elsie and Wayne Trick, raised him on the outskirts of Seattle, Washington. Jeffrey was very limited in his abilities. He could not walk. His speech was unintelligible. He was spastic, and so he had the jerky movements. But from the very beginning, when I looked into Jeffrey's eyes, I knew that he was intelligent. I knew that there was something in there that was more pronounced than his physical limitations. When he was old enough to be tested, it was discovered that Jeffrey's IQ was way above normal, approaching genius, and he proved it by excelling at school, always staying at the top of his class. Jeffrey always was a positive person and there was no holding him back on anything he wanted to do. If he would try something new, he would stay with it for hours until he succeeded in doing what he wanted to do. What's that quarterback? And then when he was 11, Jeffrey witnessed an event that would change the course of his life, a football game. Look, Jeffrey, look, look, look. Look, Jeffrey, touchdown. Watching that one football game ignited something inside of Jeffrey. And he was never the same. He just yelled and hooped and hollered and just moved his arms and his feet and thoroughly enjoyed it. At that moment, Jeffrey made a decision. He was going to become an athlete. It was an outlet for his being so competitive, because he is. I think he's the most competitive person I've ever seen in anything he does. During the next three years, Jeffrey won 10 first place ribbons at the Washington State Games for the Disabled. I felt that the only way I could prove myself to be the best at anything was to go out and win something. And in first place, it's a speed even, the one, the only, Jeffrey Pontius. It was during this time that Jeffrey gained a voice through a computer-driven device called, appropriately, a liberator. It's my way to communicate, plain and simple. His wrist, the way that it curves down due to cerebral palsy, makes it just right where he can use that finger to type. Yeah. Jeffrey programmed the device himself, ensuring that every word and phrase was tailored to his needs. Eat. Basically, there are about 10,000 words and phrases programmed under different combinations of buttons. Without this, it would take much longer to communicate with people. And what does he like to talk about most? Football. What I like about football is that it involves a lot of strategy and preparation. And so Jeffrey decided to follow his heart and work to become a professional football coach. His career counselors were less than enthusiastic. The people did not know how to react to my dream, and they were speechless. If I was in their situation, who knows how I would have reacted. But Jeffrey wasn't giving up. When he entered the University of Missouri in 1996, even before registering for classes, he headed for the football field to meet Larry Smith, coach of the Missouri Tigers. I was just completely enthralled with his presentation and his personality. I might have to do that to win the game, right? That's what we'll do. Right. He let it be known that someday he was seriously thinking about he'd like to try to be a football coach. 
That began the relationship, I think, right there with the team. Impressed with Jeffrey's determination and knowledge of the game, Coach Smith gave him a chance to prove himself. I started just by watching practice my first year. After that season, I just started coming to more practices, meetings, and my role as a coach has slowly expanded. Jeffrey attends every football practice and home game. The more football he sees, the more he wants to coach. I think he has a pretty good understanding of what it takes to play the game and, and what can be successful and what can't be. Watch. He's supposed to be watching for the fake. He often meets with the coaching staff to help analyze game videos. Associate head coach Rick Hunley relies on Jeffrey's unique perspective of the game. He's got a great eye, great eye. He watches every game. You know, I give him a great sheet. He grades the players in his own mind. He keeps a running log of, of all the defenses, all the checks, all the adjustments. He's an incredible person. He has so much uh, energy and wisdom, and he is just an inspiration to my players. Uh, Defensive coordinator Mo Ankney finds Jeffrey inspiring as well. His attitude about everything is so good that I don't think there's anything that he can't accomplish when he puts his mind to it. He has, over the course of the years that he's been here, given some of the best motivational speeches and talks to our players of any of our coaches. Being disabled, you learn how to cope with challenges, and I pass these lessons on to the team. Jeffrey's goal has now become very specific. Within 10 years, he plans to become coach of the Missouri Tigers. He is a regular, normal person. And all he thinks about is what he wants to get done. So I think from that standpoint, his perseverance and his determination are going to take him a long way. Those who know him say that Jeffrey's goal is not unrealistic. They see many miracles in his life. Well, I think Jeffrey Pontus is a miracle in itself. I wish I had, uh, you know, what he has inside. He understands the game of football uh, very well. He understands coaching and motivation, and I think he knows what it takes to be a good coach. I think that if a person believes, works hard enough, prepares himself, if the opportunity presents itself, I think that uh, any miracle is possible. This is really what he wants to do. It's the only thing he wants to do. I believe that it will happen. In fact, I don't just believe it, I know that it will happen. Miracles are a supernatural event. And if a person would know Jeffrey, they would know that his life has been supernatural. A miracle is something that is out of an individual's control and usually comes directly from God and his angels. There have been many ways that God has blessed me throughout my life. There are three things that I want to do in life. First, be the man that God wants me to be. Second is have a wife and kids. Third is be a football coach. Jeffrey is currently a junior at the University of Missouri on a full scholarship provided by the Chair Scholars Foundation. He looks forward to graduating in 2001 and hopes to continue coaching with the Tigers. Please stay with us for more miracles right after this. Tonight's show ends as it began, with a story of life-threatening danger made all the more terrifying by the fact that much of what you're about to see is real video, captured as the actual event occurred. It's a fitting story to conclude a show dedicated to the courage of the human spirit. The sweeping grandeur of the Pacific Northwest coastline is captured in postcard perfect images of fishing boats slowly maneuvering through the majestic waters. But its calm and serenity can be deceiving. The force and power of these ocean waters can turn deadly without warning. 
On June 4th, 1995, Craig Ringheimer and Greg Calavan set out for a day on the water, not realizing the danger that lay ahead. The two were longtime friends. Well, I've known him for about 15 years. I met him down where I live, met him at the river. Ever since then, I just kept in contact and just hunt together, fish together, dive together. It was an unusually warm and sunny day when Greg and Craig decided to go crabbing on Oregon's Yakina Bay. Well, we went out and we dropped our pots, and we, just, we had, it took us probably a half hour to get them set where we wanted, and we went through and you know pulled the first ones we dropped. We did that a couple times and didn't get anything that was worth keeping, so we decided you know, to kind of kill some time, just head out and just go explore a little bit. And so they steered their 15-foot boat out of the protected bay and down the channel towards the open sea. It was real smooth going out, and it was real nice out there, nothing real big. I mean, we could see land the whole time. We weren't dropping down in, in between the, the waves. But as they ventured farther out into the open waters, the wind began picking up, and the waves started getting larger. And then that's when we decided we'd better turn around and head back. And I saw a little bit of water splashing up over the bow, and I heard the motor rev up a little bit, and I looked back, and I noticed that that wave was, you know, was kind of pushing the back end of the boat up. And I looked back forward, and Next thing I know, I was diving into the water, and the boat was flipping over. Station Yakuna Bay, Petty Officer Rupert, may I help you? It was approximately 5.30 p.m. when the Yakina Bay Coast Guard Station received the 911 call. Now light off, motor light boat, vessel capsized inside North Reef, two persons in the water. Laura Shoemaker was part of the team that day. The SAR alarm went off, everybody jumped up, ran down to the boat as we were running down to the boat. They piped over the loudspeakers that we've had two people in the water, boat capsized on North Reef. And everybody knows here that that's like a really bad area to be. And we had to get out there. So we were all in high speed mode that day. The team moved quickly, preparing the 44-foot motor lifeboat for a dangerous surf rescue. Because they piped that we had two people in the water in the surf zone, we knew that we had to wear extra gear. Anytime the boat enters the surf zone, we have to wear belts and helmets. And we had basically the time from when we launched here to get out around the tips to plan what we were going to do. Help was on the way, but the 50 degree water and the six to eight foot swells had already taken their toll on the two victims. Each wave that hit would take them under until they could fight their way back to the surface. And then we'd kind of look over our shoulders and we'd say, here comes another one, here comes another one. And we'd say, okay, take a breath and then duck down. A few miles away at the Coast Guard Newport Air Facility, Lieutenant Harry Allen and his helicopter team were also responding to the call. On the way out to the helicopter, I had the swimmer dress out in his uh, water ensemble, and uh, I told them to prepare for a direct deployment to the surf. My crew and I uh, dressed out in our gear, got the helicopter ready, and started it up and taxied out, and approximately a minute to two minutes later, we were on scene overhead of the victims. What we saw when we arrived was a capsized boat with uh, two men clinging to the stern, being hit by six to eight foot surf. The two men had been in the frigid water for over 30 minutes and hypothermia was beginning to set in. I could hold on, but it just felt like that I had a hard time keeping my muscles tight because they kept wanting to shake. The Coast Guard's lifeboat had also arrived on the scene, but was having trouble locating the two victims. Coxswain Kevin Ramsey explains. Standing outside, if you're looking in across the surf, it's impossible to see anything inside. We had no idea whether they were, they could have been anywhere from right next to the rock still four miles north up the went ahead. We didn't know where the guys were until the helicopter got, up, got on top of them. Uh, so once we could see where they were at, uh, we started backing in towards them. And we got, uh, we got alongside the boat just about the same time that the rescue swimmer was being lowered down. When I'm sitting in the door, basically thinking, OK, I've got to get that guy first or, or that guy first, or I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best way to, to get both these guys out of the danger that they're in. 
Rescue swimmer Thomas Golden was lowered directly into the pounding surf. When I went down, I uh, gave them both a thumbs up. They gave me a thumbs up back. And uh, so I decided to take the closest guy to me. I was watching him, and he pointed at me and motioned me over there, so I let go, and I just swam over to him, and he asked me if I was okay. And I said, yeah, and just a little cold. I was basically concentrating on getting him in the strop, and just as I had finished getting him in the strop, uh, this wave hit us. It toppled the craft and both of the people along with the swimmer, and we lost sight of him for several seconds. I looked down, I was coming up out of the water, next thing I know I look up, I'm right below the helicopter. I looked down again, I was above the jetty, and then they set me down. Craig was finally safe on shore, but his friend was still struggling to stay alive. In the few minutes that the helo was dropping the guy on the jetty, if we hadn't been in there to pick the guy up, another break and wave could have taken him completely off the boat. Once they lifted the first person out of the water and started moving towards the jetty, then and we started backing into the boat again. Myself and the other crewman on the boat grabbed a rescue throw bag to try and get a line to him to pull him on board. Now it was up to Greg to let go of the capsized boat and somehow swim to the small throw bag that marked his only lifeline. Our first shots, he couldn't get to them. Second shot we made, he grabbed hold of the line and he was able to hold on to it while we pulled him alongside the boat. And this whole time, we had waves breaking right alongside the boat. It was a fight to hold him on. And the boat was rocking so hard that it, I really had to hang on to the boat. And uh, once I got hold of that boat, though, I wasn't going to let go. Finally, the crew was able to get Greg on board. I figured I was saved. <laughs> I was gone. I remember, you know, I was real cold. I was just thanking him for getting me in the boat. Greg and Craig were transported to a hospital where they were treated for hypothermia and released later that day. Oh, yeah. I'm Oh my life to him, you know, they saved mine, saved me, and, and I just really appreciate it. I'm glad they're there. Without the swift action of the helicopter and lifeboat teams, the chances for these two men to survive was almost non-existent. And even with all their professional training, the conditions that day required more than just skill and precision to succeed. It took a miracle for everything to fall into place and for these lives to be saved. We'll be right back. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us. And a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night. <laughs>